Our Bible word is Colossians 3 verses 1 to 2. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So first, let us have a look at the context of Colossians. So, yeah, we have an early Christian hymn, and it's also known as the Colossians hymn. And yeah, we have the Apostle Paul, he's writing this epistle to Christians in Colossae. And this happened while he was on his third missionary journey. And we can read that about that in Acts, from Acts 18 to Acts 21. And eventually he landed up in Ephesus. And yeah, Paul stayed for about two to three years. And it looks like he was also imprisoned here. And because if you read later, or in later epistles, for example, in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians about that, he was imprisoned, etc. So we're not told this very clearly, for example, in the book of Acts, but the epistle to Colossians is one of Paul's captivity epistles. And there's four that Paul wrote from prison, or while he was under house detention, etc. And these are Philemon and Colossians, and there's also Ephesians and Philippians. These are referred to as Paul's captivity epistles. Now, some scholars would date Colossians to this time period when Paul was in Ephesus, his Ephesian imprisonment. So that would date to around 54, 55 AD. Other scholars would date it to Paul's late imprisonment. That's when he was in Rome, under house arrest in Rome. That's roughly 60 to 62 AD. And... Some scholars would also say because this, this epistle has so many new words, it looks like somebody else wrote this letter. Somebody wrote it after the time of Paul, one of his students, or one of those belonging to the Pauline school. But the approach that, that we will take here is that, that Paul wrote this, or probably he got somebody to write it on his behalf. Because there's this new words, this new grammar, new style that we encounter also in Colossians. Maybe it was Epaphras or Timothy who wrote this letter on behalf of Paul. Because Paul also towards the end, he gives this personal conclusion or his, he adds his personal note to this epistle. We find this there in chapter 4 verses 18. If we go read it there, this salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. So, maybe Epaphras or Timothy wrote this letter on behalf of Paul. Then Paul went through this letter and also then gave his final, added his own salutation towards the epistle towards the end. So that's the approach that we will take here. So it's written by Paul while he was in prison in Ephesus. We cannot be 100% sure about this. Roughly 54 to 55 AD. And he was in prison also with this guy called Epaphras. Like I mentioned his name before. And Epaphras was actually the person who founded the Christian community in, Co in Colossae. And he probably also founded the Christian community in Laodicea. Now Laodicea and Colossae, these two cities were situated quite close to each other. And they were situated in the Lycus Valley. That's where the Lycus River ran down. And, and because we also read that Paul also wrote another epistle to the Laodiceans. That's in 4 verses 16. If we go read there, Paul writes, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So obviously Paul, he did not, not just write this epistle to the Colossians here, but also to congregations in Laodicea. And he did not establish these congregations. It was probably this Epaphras that we also read here. If you go read there 
in chapter 1, verses, verses 7, the, Apol, or the author writes there, As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. So it was this Epaphras who founded these, these Christian congregations in Colossae and probably also in Laodicea. And now Paul came to hear of trouble facing these congregations. And in, this, in the valley of the Lycus, or the Lycus Valley, there were very, very strong Jewish communities already established. So maybe these opponents or, or, or troubling the Christians in Colossae and Laodicea, there were maybe Jews. We cannot to be sure about this, but the indications in the epistle is that they were influenced by Jewish teachers or people from the synagogue. Because many Christians at this time, they still went to the synagogue. Because at this time, Christianity and Judaism, it was still kind of under the same umbrella. So maybe there were some here or some Jews who influenced them and also suggesting that Christ, well, is not enough. That there's more, there's more spiritual riches to be attained somehow. And these opponents, Paul actually calls their teaching a philosophy. If we go there to chapter 2 verses 8, Paul writes there, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So they're giving another teaching. What Paul, Paul, the author, writes here, he calls it a philosophy. Now the author also continues and says in verse 9, For in Him, that's Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. So it's saying that Christ, everything you need, is in Christ. In Him the fullness of the Godhead dwells. This is the full, the most complete revelation of God. You don't need to go any, anywhere else to know anything. So these troublemakers, these opponents, or people that come to upset these Christians, like I said, there were probably Jews from the local synagogue. And the reason we say this, because if we go read chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says there, So let no one judge you in food, or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. And also in other parts of Colossians, Paul writes about that, he says they observe a special diet, because they say don't eat, don't touch, etc., and that they must abstain. And that there's also this concern maybe for purity laws. Also for law observance. If you go read there, chapter 2, verses 14. And here and there, like in places like two, chapter 2, verse 11, verses 18, also in chapter 3, Paul writes about circumcision. Specifically, if you go to chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. Paul writes there this, about this having put, put on the new man in Christ. And this, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And another thing is, because these troublemakers, they propose this physical abstinence, and do not touch, do not taste, etc. It might also suggest they were engaged or claimed to engage in mystical practices and, and worshipping with the angels. Because Paul also, well, the author writes there in chapter 2, verses 18, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So it, it seems that they claim to engage in mystical practices where they go and ascend, make these mystical ascents and worship with the angels, so to speak. So we maybe have to do with a group of Jewish mystics or people who claim to are engaged with mystical practices. And they are saying, yeah, 
Yeah, we find more. This is uh, more, more better knowledge of God. Yeah, you are more spiritual. Yeah, you are better. And the author, yeah, also Paul, with Paul's sanction, saying, no, that's nonsense. In Christ, you have everything. So for most of Colossians chapter 2, Paul brings attention to these troublemakers and their teaching that's proving to be so attractive. And people are drawn to it because it's from the Jewish synagogue and it's claiming a great ancestry that it goes back many years and it's the privilege of belonging to the Jewish people and specifically this group in Colossae that appears to be involved in mystical practices and worship alongside angels and Paul wants to try and convince these Christians don't be drawn to that don't be attracted to that because compared to Christ they are involved with things of the flesh their strict asceticism their bodily discipline the harshness do not eat do not taste do not touch so the ascetic practices that they claim is like a special way of worship and it places it on par with Jesus there's nothing special about Jesus and Paul wants to tell them you can't compare Jesus with what these guys are offering you for example imagine you have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini whatever your favorite car is I personally wouldn't mind having a Lamborghini but imagine you have a Lamborghini or whatever but you decide to drive a bicycle and people ask you if you have the Lamborghini why are you driving a bicycle there's no comparison the same thing Paul is doing here you cannot compare Jesus with what these Jews from the synagogue here is offering you Jesus is incomparable to whatever you have known before and this comes across in various ways. Already in the hymn that we find in Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20, there it emphasizes the preeminence of Christ both in creation and in redemption. For example, if we read verses 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. So in other words, the fullness of deity. The fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. Also, if we go to chapter 2, if we read especially verses 3, Paul writes, in, in whom, that's Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Something similar is said about this treasure, this immense riches that is in Jesus, there in chapter 1, verses 27. So Jesus is this treasure of wisdom and knowledge. If you go also to verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. So Paul is telling them, in Jesus you have everything that you will ever need. What these people will offer you here is no comparison. They concern with things of the flesh. Things belonging to the old way of things. Christ has crucified the flesh. And we have died with Christ. If you read in chapter 2 from verse 11, Paul writes, In whom you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So this is an important part of Paul's overall theology. You'll find it all over his epistles. When Christ was crucified, he crucified the body of flesh. And the body of flesh is our body of sin. That's where our sin comes from. And that is what Christ has destroyed on the cross. Now these people whose teaching proves to be so attractive, their interest belongs to the realm of the flesh. Fasting, circumcision, not eating this, not touching that. And Paul says, man, that's part of the old way. It's not relevant anymore. Christ has killed, has crucified the flesh with its sin. Don't be caught up in the world of the flesh. The flesh is not a means to overcome sin. Christ has gotten rid of the flesh. 
And if we also go on to verse 12, we were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So we have died with Christ. Our sinful nature of flesh died with Jesus. And we've been raised with Jesus to this new life, a new form of existence. Jesus has recreated humanity. There's a new form of humanity on the scene, guided by that God's Spirit, a life in the Spirit. So don't be caught up in these things that these other teachers want to draw you to. That's, that's old stuff. That's old news. And it won't help you in the, in the fight against sin. Because Jesus also died for our sin. He not only crucified the flesh, he also killed the law, if you read further on. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So Jesus crucified the flesh. He also crucified the law in a sense, that it's no longer more applicable. Because the law holds us accountable for our sin. It wants to punish us. But God circumvented the law and granted us grace. But these teachers, they still caught up in the law also. But Christ has nailed the law to the cross. And also, if you read in verse 15, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. These principalities and powers refers to angelic beings. There was this belief that angels were in charge of the world, they ruled the nations. Some of these angels also were bad because they misguided the nations, also Israel itself. And now these Jews in Colossae, they aimed or claimed to worship with the angels. And now Paul also says, Jesus has actually defeated them. If you read again, having disarmed principalities and powers. It refers to these angelic beings. Christ is superior. He's conquered these angelic beings who lead the nations astray. So Paul wants to bring home, don't drive a bicycle if you have a Lamborghini. Christ is our Lamborghini. He's incomparable. He's the Lord. In Him, the fullness of deity of the Godhead is in Him. In Him is all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You can't go anywhere else and find anything better. Everything we need, we have in Jesus. And if you now focus on our immediate pericope, it focuses now on this perspective from which the Christian life should be lived. And that's chapters 3, verses 1 to 4. So based on this fact that we've died with Christ, in other words, the sinful nature, the flesh, as we've as died we were buried with Christ in baptism. We were raised with Christ. Now Paul states this in chapter 3 verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So verses 1 specifically is a statement of principle. If then you were raised with Christ. Of course, if we were baptized, we were immersed into Christ, into his death. And we were also raised with Christ into a new life. So if that has happened, and it has for us as Christians, we must seek those things which are above. Because Christ has inaugurated a whole new order of existence, a whole new life. It's no longer a life confined in the flesh. We cannot beat sin in the flesh. We cannot really be spiritual people come to God in the flesh because flesh leads us to sin. But that's what these other people, they try to trap you in the flesh where they're fasting and other things they do and through what they claim to worship with angels or whatever. We can't do that. We must think on a whole new different level, a whole new order. Christ has brought about a new creation, a new order of existence. And that is where our minds must be. That's where our thoughts must be. With Christ who is above, 
And it also says who's at the right hand of the Father. And yeah, it's alluding to Psalm 110 verses 1. And that is the Old Testament verse that's most frequently quoted or alluded to in the New Testament. It explains what happens to Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is exalted. He's glorified. And that is who we are connected with. Not the realm of the flesh here below. We are connected with this new reality with Christ where he is at the right hand of the Father. Then Paul also reiterates in verse 3, For you died. In other words, that, that fleshly body of yours, it's died off, that body of sin. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now this life, of course, refers to the glorious nature of being conformed to Jesus' image. The glory of Jesus, who's the image of God. It's hidden for now, but it carries on in the next verse. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So this is a perspective that Christians should live from. And he warns them at, at that time. Don't be attracted to, to that teaching. It looks appealing and they make all these claims of how wonderful it is. But don't fall for it. Of course Paul refers it to it as a philosophy. The perspective which we as Christians, as followers of Jesus must live by, is above. It's where Christ is, who's brought about the new order of existence. That is where our orientation must be. And this life that we share with Jesus, it's hidden now, but it's glorious. And this hidden glory will be revealed when Jesus returns.